get rolling. You don't have too much of a view of my messy kitchen. <laughs> um, we are live. Okay. Hey. So good evening, everyone. Um, I will call the regular meeting of the Brookfield Board of Education to order. So let's all stand where we are and say the pledge. <clears throat> I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, of America and to the republic for which it stands, stands one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. Okay, we have everyone here virtually, and uh, we can see and hear everyone who's talking. So, so far, so good. Um, in terms of public comment tonight, just for anybody who is watching live, we are not going to be able to have a live participation from you. So if you do have public comment, you can email uh, me personally at my board email address. And we will stay read those public comments at the end of our meeting tonight. So my email is Fernandez, F-E-R-N-A-N-D-E-S-R at brookfieldps.org. So we are accepting those comments now until 7.20. Um, and after 7.20, they will be submitted as written correspondence. So anything that's submitted now will just be read at the end. Okay. So we can move on now to written correspondence. Okay. Laura Orban wrote regarding the Special Education Cost Cooperative. Ron Jaffe shared a few articles with us. He shared an article about health centers at Danbury area schools. He shared an article from the Search Institute, and he also shared an article about public meetings in the time of COVID-19. Jean Hartnett wrote regarding the Sandy Hook Promise. Mark Mulvaney wrote regarding school lunches, and Amy Chiafari wrote regarding pay for Paris. That's it. Okay, thank you. We can move on now to of board minutes. I will make a motion that the board approve the minutes as to was recommended, the regular meeting on March 4th, 2020. I'll second. Okay, for all those in favor, just visually raise your hand and leave them raised for a little while. So, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, the superintendent's update. All right, thank you, Rosa. Um, first thing I'd like to do before I uh, introduce Paul Avery is just share a few words about um, my gratitude for our team, for the community support, for the board support, um, and for all the work that everyone is doing to get us through uh, the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, it's really important to kind of chronicle some of the things that have happened in such a short amount of time. On uh, March 12th, which was a Thursday afternoon, uh, we were one of the early schools to close, um, and uh, that was in participation with Mr. Avery, who is here helping us, as well as listening to the governor's de declaration. Um, and, and that was really early onset of social distancing and moving forward with that. Um, the team, uh, the leadership team, has been working 24-7, as I indicated in one of my communications recently, um, and I couldn't be more proud. Uh, right from the start, we started planning for supplemental learning, which, again, we closed school on Thursday afternoon, worked all weekend, and we're ready with supplemental learning on mo this past Monday for students. Um, since then, the commissioner uh, has uh, waived the need for waivers for all schools in Connecticut to begin distance learning. And in short order, in just a couple of days, we've gotten uh, our teachers on board and our staff on board. Our administrative team has been working their tails off. Um, I have to thank Eric, our tech director, and Dr. Ruby, our assistant superintendent, for the yeoman's task 
of, of really leading from the instructional piece of how this is going to work and, and setting up the framework and, and the work process going forward. And also need to thank uh, our teachers union uh, for jumping right in and helping with this. Um, we've gotten a lot of positive emails and uh, thank yous regarding um, how we're moving forward. Uh, in addition to that, you've all seen um, my comprehensive level of communication and now principals are starting to <coughs> further communications as we move forward. Um, everything from the closure decision to calendar issues, technology, uh, serving lunch, learning resources, cleaning the schools, coordinating with the town and state officials, um, many conference calls that I've shared that I've been on with either the governor or the commissioner both together. So lots of things going on. Um, and truly, while I know it's a hackneyed phrase in this time, we are in unprecedented times. Um, more of us have, uh, none of us have been through uh, the disruption that this has caused ever in our lifetime. And let's hope we never have to face this again. Um, it is challenging, it is uncertain. Uh, for now, we have to accept this as the new normal, at least for the near term. We need to settle in and be patient. Um, I think a positive attitude and a positive outlook in terms of stop looking at this as an inconvenience and irritating because we're here and now we have to emerge on the other end of this. And so we need to focus on safety, wellness, and health. We have to help each other out. Um, we will get through this, I think, with... Uh, an optimistic view, rational behavior, cooperation will emerge stronger on the other end and as an organization we certainly will be uh, much more agile and versatile. So I just thank you um, for everything, uh, the public and the board sending well wishes, checking on me personally to see how we're doing. We're putting a lot of time in um, and I think we're, we're in a very good place and I'm just really proud of the team and I, I needed to say that. Um, I don't know if the board has any questions of me before I turn it over to Mr. Avery, our uh, sanitarian for Brookfield. Um, I just have one, um, not really a question, but just um, some of the comments that, you know, I get from parents. Um, could you give us sort of, um, I know that everything is still up in the air and, and really kind of fluid still, but um, could you give us an idea in terms of what's in the realm of possibility still? And that might mean everything, but... Um, you know, sort of, you know, parents are like, are we going back to school at all this year? And, you know, I think that's a, it's a possibility, but it's also a possibility that we don't. So yep. do you have any sort of Sure. What I better? Would, no, good question, Rosa. I think, you know, I'll be very honest with you. I don't know the answer to that. I, I've shared when I was handing out lunches today, which by the way, was a blast meeting a lot of parents that I've never had a chance to meet and, and seeing the kids. Um, I wore a mask and gloves and did everything I was supposed to do. Um, but it, it was interesting. They were asking me that same question, and um, I was very honest with them. I just don't know the answer. I don't have any insider information. Uh, I watch the news like everybody else and wait, up, wait on the press conferences. I'm in touch all the time with Mr. Dunn in case he gets any governmental you know, information directly from the state. Um, what I can tell you is the CIAC, which is the governing body for athletics, uh, had their meeting this morning. They're still optimistic and they're holding on to spring sports um, because the high school spring sports season goes all the way to June, whereas everybody knows the NCAA canceled the spring sports season for colleges. They end in April. So there's, they're still holding out hope that we might be able to get into schools, um, you know, post-March sometime in late April. Um, Right now, the governor still has um, the closures of all the schools until March 31st. That has not been extended formally yet. Um, for everything I'm hearing, it appears that we will be out for longer than March 31st, but nothing definitive. What I can tell you is our teachers and administrators um, are working very hard on developing the distance learning uh, program and what that's going to look like. And over the next couple of days, um, parents will be communicated with and our plan at this point, it may take an extra day, but our plan right now is to get the distance learning up and running as best we can by Monday, March 23rd. So trying to get us to normalcy as quickly as possible. So um, all students are moving up in grade levels and seniors um, shouldn't have to worry about graduation requirements? I would say the plan is for that to occur but the distance learning is going to happen and distance learning and the assignments therein will be mandatory so it's not an automatic we have work that needs to be done and all of this is going to evolve over time 
uh, beginning on Monday. And all of us in Connecticut, all students in the nation and, and educators and parents in the nation are going through this, frankly, together. And we're discovering the answers as we go. We do want everybody to matriculate a year up. We certainly want our high school seniors to graduate and move on to, to college or whatever their plans are. That is the intention. Okay. Thank you. That's Thank good information. You. Thank you. Those are great questions. Thank you. Anything so, yeah, else? We, yeah, you can continue. Um, okay. With, yep. Okay, so what I'd, what I'd like to do is introduce Paul Avery. He's the Brookfield Town Sanitarian, works for the health department, works hand in hand with uh, Dr. Sullivan, who wasn't able to make it tonight. And I, Paul has a few things to share, and then he is here for the board to ask him any questions after he shares a few things. Paul, I'd like to turn it over to you. Yep. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I am the town sanitarian. I've been here for 11 years and I am the acting director of the health of the town when uh, Dr. Sullivan's not around. He just had a surgery, so he's been out for a while. Um, not great timing, but I think this might get a little bit worse before it gets better. So he's back now on limited duty. Um, Paul, can you stop for a second? Yep, board, sure. board members, I just want to make sure. Can you hear Paul? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. We're good. So um, I don't really have much to say other than um, daily I have been tracking, you know, the positive cases in the state. That's the thing that's of most interest in terms of where this is going. Uh, will our numbers greatly increase? They're increasing right now. Um, but still, I think testing is not quite where it's going to end up being, and we're probably going to see more increased positive cases as time goes on here. And, with any luck, we'll have some kind of leveling out uh, of that rate of positive cases uh, such that maybe we can get back to school. But I really don't have a comment on that one way or the other right now. It is very difficult to say whether or not there's school year left in, in my personal opinion. Um, but if you look at the Internet and you go to the State Department of Public Health website, uh, they have a specific page just for coronavirus. And every 24 hours, they update it. And as of today, there's 96 positive people here in the state, 69 of those in Fairfield County, 11 in Hartford County, 10 in New Haven County, 5 in Litchfield, and 1 in Middlesex. And as of today, Brookfield has its first positive case, um, which is of particular interest, of course, to us, um, just to see what's going to happen here in our own town. Um, so we got our first positive today. Of course, it's HIPAA, so we can't talk about who it is. Dr. Sullivan and I know who the person is. It's a man between the age of 45 and 64. He's self-isolating right now at home. Um, I do think it's valuable to take a look at that Department of Public Health website for coronavirus because this updating of cases is right on the main page as soon as you look at it. So uh, it just gives you a quick read on what's happening. Um, the ability of hospitals in this state to test now is greatly increased in the last 72 hours, uh, so that's a very good thing. Um, myself, I've been participating in um, two times a week conferences with the uh, Department of Public Health's Epidemiology Office, uh, two times a week with the Governor's Conference. We just had one yesterday. We'll have another one on Friday at 5. Uh, and then the CDC has been holding two conferences a week as well on the federal level. And department heads here at Town Hall are meeting every day. I don't know if you know what's going on at Town Hall. We closed it uh, to the public. And we're only in here 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. right now. And the staff is rotating, so we're just kind of hanging out answering the phones. But that's all mostly in the interest of keeping the public out of the building and not having all of us here since we don't have walk-ins. There's quite a, you know, it's only answering the phones. Um, my phone's been very busy, um, everything from completely crazy people to, to you know, good questions. Um, but that's pretty much the size of it. Um, if you have any questions of me, feel free. Um, Dr. Sullivan, you know, he'd love to be here tonight. He would be here, but he just had this surgery, so we're trying to, I'm telling him to stay home completely. He still came in today and yesterday, uh, so that's a bit of a battle with him. He's a hard-working man, but... Um, he, I, you know, I, I definitely didn't want to see him come out here tonight. Uh, and I appreciate you having me. And if you have any questions, I'll do the best I can. Thank you very much. Yep, sure. 
Okay, um, we can move on unless anybody has any questions um, for Paul. We can move on. So I'll I'll wait to see. Does anybody have any questions? So let's move on to our subcommittee reports. And up first is facilities. Okay, so we don't have a whole lot to report because we had a special meeting on February 19th. And we had this meeting on March 4th, so not even two weeks later. But we reviewed the school dude reports. There were no new project updates since I reported at our last board event meeting on February 19th. But the majority of our meeting was spent on discussing the BHS um, boys locker room project. So I'm currently working with Eddie from Tecton to put together a presentation that we hope to present to you on April 1st um, to get a lot of um, board insight and to answer any questions that you have and kind of discuss our game plan for moving forward. And that's about it. We spent most of the time talking about that, about the locker room project. Okay. Um, and so they'll be prepared on the first to present to us. And of course, we don't really know if how that's right, going to hopefully, work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we'll, hopefully we'll, we'll get some more information on that. Thank you. Okay. Um, up next is finance. Oh, Bob, you're muted. I can't hear you. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. All right, so I'll be very brief tonight. Um, at our meeting uh, this month, we spent our time going through the update on special education cost exposure for the current year. And we went through uh, the answers that we needed to provide to the Board of Finance and to the Book of Selectmen uh, on the budget. Um, for those of you who attended the Board of Finance meeting this last Wednesday, uh, we uh, you, you saw the results of all of that, so there's nothing really else to report. Um, we went through the financial, the financial reports for the month, and there really was no new news this month. So, uh, um, so it was the same exposures we've been talking about for the last month. So, um, I will add that the Board of Finance um, uh, is being supportive to us um, in a couple, in a number of ways. On the current year. They're actually waiting for the Board of Selectmen to resubmit the funding request. Uh, they had declined it at their last meeting, not because they didn't want to give the funding, but that the wording of the resolution from the Board of Selectmen was written wrong. So the Board of Selectmen needs to resubmit that, and then I expect that they will go ahead and approve it for the current year funding. And, uh, and then on the budget, they are currently deliberating. They met uh, last night, and they're meeting again tonight. So we'll hear more, and we'll talk about that more in a bit. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Bob? Okay. So we can move on now to the consent agenda. Okay. I will make a motion that the board approve the items on the consent agenda as recommended, the February financials. A second. Okay, sorry. Um, all in favor, just raise your hand in front of the camera for a bit. All um, right. Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. <laughs> okay, we can move on now to new business, the healthy food option and certification. Okay, this is a lengthy one. I will make a motion that pursuant to CGS section 10215F, the Brookfield Board of Education certifies that all food items offered for sale to students in the schools under its jurisdiction and not exempted from the Connecticut Nutrition Standards published by the Connecticut State Department of Education will comply with the Connecticut Nutrition Standards during the period of July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. This certification shall include all food offered for sale to students separately from reimbursable meals at all times and from all sources, including but not limited to school stores, vending machines, school cafeterias, culinary programs, and any fundraising activities on school premises sponsored by the school or non-school organizations and groups. Second. Okay, Joy has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 
Okay. Okay, good. Thank you, everyone. Um, next is another healthy food and beverage exemption. Okay. I make a motion that the Brookfield Board of Education will allow the sale to students of food items that do not meet the Connecticut Nutrition Standards and Beverages not listed in Section 10-221Q of the Connecticut General Statutes, provided that the following conditions are met. The sale is in connection with an event occurring after the end of the regular school day or on the weekend. The sale is at the location of the event, and the food and beverage items are not sold from a vending machine or a school store. An event is an occurrence that involves more than just a regularly scheduled practice, meaning our extracurricular activity. For example, soccer games, school plays, and interscholastic debates are events. The soccer practices, play rehearsals, and debate team meetings are not. The regular school day is the period from midnight before to 30 minutes after the end of the official school day. Location means where the event is being held. Second. Okay, any discussion on this one? Okay, not seeing none, we will vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. Okay, we can move into old business and we have some policies. So, Amy, take it away. I recommend a motion that the board approve the deletion of policy number 4118.52, rights, responsibilities, and duties, acceptable computer networking, and replace it with CAVE policy number 4118.51, social networking and CAVE policy number 4118.4, electronic mail, for a final reading as recommended by the Policy and Communications Subcommittee. First reading was on February 19th, 2020. Second. Okay, is there any discussion on this? And or Debbie, did you receive any other edits on this? I did not receive any changes or edits. Okay, so unless there's other discussion, we can vote. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion passes and we can move on to the next policy. I recommend a motion that the board approve the revisions Policy number 4118.5, acceptable computer use for a final reading is recommended by the Policy and Communications Subcommittee. First reading was February 19th, 2020. Second. Okay, any discussion on this or edits, Debbie? No, nope, I didn't receive any feedback at all. Okay, so all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, motion passes and our last policy today I make a motion that the board approve the revisions to policy number 4118.6, cell phone district issue communication device for a final reading as recommended by the policy communication subcommittee. First reading was February 19th, 2020. Second. Okay. And any yeah, I didn't get any comments on this one either. Okay. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. We can now move on to the Board of Education budget estimate, our discussion of the budget, which was primarily the reason why we needed to meet. Um, and that was the important item for tonight. Um, not a motion, but we need to just continue our discussion. And I'm actually gonna hand it over to Dr. Brill and maybe everybody can just put their um, mics on mute so that he can kind of talk through it and not fight for the camera. Thanks, Rosa. Uh, so, uh, again, um, I have to thank uh, the Finance Committee, and it's important to thank uh, Central Office Team, Ken and his leadership, and certainly our principals for really um, being creative, digging in, analyzing their budgets, um, and, and, and use, use that term scrubbing the budget, and we've done some, some really good work there. Um, it's important, uh, first of all, to kind of frame the discussion. The first piece is um, it was made very clear to me uh, at the last meeting when I was asked to bring between three hundred and four thousand dollars in possible reductions to the board that um, the board was not uh, in favor of, of being near the students at all when it comes to reductions, uh, whether that's eliminating programs or any kind of staffing. And they really it was it made abundantly clear. Um, for the superintendent to continue the work with uh, the leadership team and uh, do the best uh, the best that we can in, in achieving that. I think we've come uh, up with some 
some pretty creative ways and um, pretty smart ways of going about uh, the significant budget reductions that we were asked uh, to, to handle. Um, I'd like to start by saying there were some goals. Uh, there were really four goals is how I categorize things. The first goal was stay as far from students as possible with any reductions. The second goal, uh, stay the course with the strategic plan as best you can. Um, although reductions sometimes mean um, being less aggressive um, or really slowing down some of the uh, either professional learning or curriculum work that we're doing, try to stay the course as best you can with those priorities. The third, uh, keep as many investments that we're looking forward to next year, keep those investments uh, on the table if possible. And then the fourth was keep class size at Board of Ed guidelines. So really try to do all three of those things. Um, and, and so with that, um, it's important to also uh, bring in that and remind people that I present uh, a proposed budget for the following year as far back as December 5th of 2019. And the principals and I and the central office team start working on the budget in October. And I, I tell that story briefly and remind everybody of that because things change from when we first developed the budget over the, 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 the several months of our Brookfield budget process uh, in terms of actual numbers. Uh, numbers and figures and grants and all kinds of things from the state or the federal government or whatever it might be, uh, even from our local um, uh, sewer department in terms of what the costs are going to be. So those chain changes are reflected. So the Board of Selectmen uh, voted uh, over a month ago to reduce the proposed Board of Education budget by $817,000. That's almost a full 2% uh, of the budget, so it's a significant um, hit to the budget. So we really had to be creative and really do a lot of work on this budget. In addition to that, since budget proposal back in December, the, there have been a few ads, some of those changes that I was just referring to. So the $817,000 that we needed to find really was an actual $871,000. I'm just going to go through a couple of things that have increased um, that we have to put in the budget for next year. Extended school year is up by about $7,300. The sewer cost is up by $2,000. Uh, FICA for some staff that we're looking for is up by $1,300. Um, there's a pension liability we have, and that's a $33,000 adjustment that's been added. Um, magnet school tuition, uh, $5,400. And um, a monitor um, in the lunchroom at Whiskey Near that has to be monitored due to enrollment, due to cleaning needs, um, and these kinds of things. That gets us at $871,000. So now the team needs to, to look how are we going to reduce that uh, to make this budget work. Having done that, it was important to break... Uh, Ken and I worked and we talked and we thought it's important to break this up into three specific areas. So the first one there's tier one, and those are the, the big ticket budget items. Then there's tier two, which is all that work the principals uh, have done along with the, our central office team in terms of scrubbing the budget. That's the leadership team work. And then the third tier is further work we need to do. Um, but we have a big chunk that we're able to work on in tier one, those big ticket items. And you're, you'll be happy to hear when I walk through this, they stay very far from students and they really are all about just general operation of the district and some big chunks that are going to help us. And also the way the Board of Finance, Board of Selectmen, and Board of Ed have been talking about what the ways we might account for um, certain big areas a little, a little bit differently going into next year's budget. So the first one is we've been doing some analysis on our salaries and where uh, we consistently underrun uh, the salary line. Uh, that could be anything from the reason being uh, retirements where uh, a more highly paid employee leaves and a, le a lesser paid newer employee joins us. It also is, has to do with leaves of absences and the experience uh, with things like that. Um, so there's a build in there of $120,000 to the good. And um, I know Mr. Belden has been talking with the Board of Finance and with Rosa, uh, Mrs. Fernandez, and, and so that could be discussed a little bit more. But that's a public discussion that's been going on. There's also a contingency um, built in for special education outplacements, big topic of discussion over the last bunch of months. And so that is $294,000. So we're looking at um, the Board of Finance really wants to support us if we really need that money going forward rather than just building it into our budget. So it's something the board should discuss tonight. 
Health insurance, one hundred and sixty-seven thousand dollars. Ken had budgeted, I think, nine and a half percent. Ken? Yes. Yeah, nine and a half percent was what we were uh, we were guided by our um, insurance person to build into the budget. It actually looks like it's coming in at six and a half percent. That's a savings of almost one hundred and seventy thousand um, dollars. Mrs. Marion uh, does the some of the auditing now, and that reduces our audit fee by five thousand um, dollars. We also have a transportation ride share with Bethel to Nanawag High School, which could save us eighteen thousand dollars toward that. Um, that uh, that goal of ours, um, adult ed and adult ed tuition uh, comes to almost three thousand dollars, and then there's a health services grant which is going to be coming in for forty three hundred dollars. All of that that I just went through in that big tier one big chunk adds up to six hundred twelve thousand dollars toward the eight hundred seventy one I was just talking about. So we're two thirds there. So that's really important and it hits all of our goals. It doesn't touch class size, it doesn't touch uh, anything toward our strategic initiatives, and it stays very far from directly impacting students. So that's really good news in terms of working on the budget. The next tier is where we really started to scrub the budget and really look at all of our accounts, look at our actuals, and make some, make some serious decisions with staff and programming. So the first one is, um, we um, have determined that there is a portion of salary for our existing lunch monitors that we are able to pay through the lunch cafeteria account. And so that um, helps us to the amount over the course of a year to $30,000. We had also budgeted for the 20 or so plus unaffiliated employees, we had built in a 3% increase. We've reduced that by 1% down to 2% and that's gonna save us about $10,000 across all of our unaffiliated employees. We also had a retirement in our payroll department and so um, we're going from three full-time people in that department down to two full-time and one part-time. That'll save us almost $50,000. So that's a, that's a big a decision point that we had, a lot of discussion about that, but with, with the implementation of Munis, with the, the skill set of folks that we have, and with technology improvements here at Central Office, we think we can handle it. Um, the teacher union, I've complimented them before on their efforts with distance learning. Um, we haven't formally signed off on this, but one of the things they have built into the contract is that we put professional development funds into the budget um, for them to the tune of $20,000. Um, historically, that is something we really hold dear and um, keep sacred, frankly, because we want to ensure that our teachers are moving forward with professional learning. Um, but this is one of the areas we made a hard decision, and at this point, the teacher union is in agreement that for one year, we can make an agreement, since this is such a difficult budget, that we can hold on that. And again, that's $20,000. Uh, Ken has looked at the actuals, really looked and analyzed the history with our um, Facility Director Dan Caldwell and reduced building and maintenance to from uh, reduced twenty five thousand uh, dollars in our building and maintenance uh, category. We also are very comfortable looking at the projections for a pre K program that we think will be bringing in an additional ten thousand dollars in revenue. So again, that helps us toward this uh, goal. Um, there is going to be a hold on social studies professional learning uh, to the tune of ten thousand um, dollars. We worked really hard with Dr. Ruby on that and where we could uh, work with our building principals and Mrs. Farias and uh, have some other opportunities. And that's something, again, we'll be a little less aggressive like I've been talking about. Um, our language arts professional learning, uh, we had budgeted um, and we are reducing that in half uh, by $30,000. Um, and so while we might lose some momentum, uh, for sure, we'll just be less aggressive in some of our strategic priorities. Tier two, scrubbing the budget slowing our, our uh, approach on uh, some of our strategic priorities, that adds up to $184,000. So tier one was $612,000, tier two $184,000. That leaves us about $74,000 that we need to find. Now I can tell you that while that hasn't been defined yet, because that's going to take meeting with the leadership team, I'm not just gonna make those decisions in a vacuum, we're really, we found, I just talked through $800,000 that we found. And it really, for the most part, is far from students with the exception of the professional learning, which is disappointing, but this is uh, a time for difficult decisions. We're likely gonna start to attack that $74,000 taking a look at professional memberships, professional dues, um, some supply, different supply accounts, furniture, 
things like that. But again, I won't determine that in a vacuum. I'm going to have to talk with the leadership team. Um, and um, that, that gets us to that $870,000. So I'm sure there's a lot of questions. Um, this document is in, <clears throat> the document <clears throat> is in your board of that email. Oh, right okay. now if you want to refer to it. Thank you, Ken. Ken forwarded that via email just now to all of you. And so it's a listing there that I walk through so you can get a visual on that. Um, yep. And I'm certainly open to any questions. I know I went a little long there, but I wanted to break that down for everybody as, simple, uh, as simply as possible. And we're here to answer any questions uh, you may have. And Dr. Ruby has joined us um, uh, on the conference uh, as well. I emailed it to her also. So um, I think the best way to maybe go about this is to maybe go give everybody, go down the list and sort of give every board member a chance to sort of ask those questions and kind of have a dialogue with you. This way we're not all fighting for the airtime. Um, and then we can just keep cycling through that rotation so that everybody's questions, you know, are eventually answered. So, um, Bob, do you want to start off with any of your initial questions or reactions to this list? I'm doing it again, so I'm got myself off mute. Um, as you know, I've been very active with the Board of Finance um, on, you know, trying to go back and forth with them on questions. Um, I just don't have any questions for Dr. Burrell's list, um, but I do have some things I wanted to share, if that's okay. Um, the uh, First of all, I did the analysis on the salary line. Um, the other night, the Board of Finance, it was a really long meeting with the Board of Finance, but they were basically through most of that meeting pushing us on were we being appropriately aggressive on how we built our salary plan. Um, and their point was interesting because, you know, we budget what I call P times Q, which is take the exact list of people that we are expecting to employ and we multiply by the exact amount that's in the teacher contract. And I'm talking about teachers here for a second. And we built that budget for years and we usually take, uh, you guys remember the teacher turnover number, the, it's usually somewhere between minus 80 and minus $120,000. Um, and that's a, a bit of a risk assessment on our part that says we'll underrun the P times Q budget um, because we have retirements and we, you know, people leave at a high salary and we have higher back, maybe not down at the bottom of rung, but at a lower salary than the people who left. And we've been not only meeting that number, but we've actually been exceeding that underrun, whether it's more retirees or it's people who take unpaid leaves. Um, and this year happens to be unpaid leaves is the big driver, not, not the retirement turnover. But I went back three years and we have run by 230, 220 to 230 the last two years. And, um, and the year before that, it was like 400,000, it was huge. You might remember that was the year we had all those retirements all in the same year. And then when we were glad, quite frankly, that we under that year because we had a big special ed issue that year and we applied that savings to cover that. So the discussion that I pose and I continue to pose is our current budget at 80,000 and we've been running at two, a little over 200,000 every year um, and consistently running 200,000 under maybe for different reasons. So the question as a board that we should ask ourselves and that I would advocate that we do is to take a little bigger than normal uh, reduction against that uh, against you know the the pure math, if you will, and uh, and go with a two hundred thousand uh, dollar assumption that we between le unpaid leaves and um, and the uh, uh, and any turnover that we actually will underrun this the mathematical calculation of the salary. Um, it's a bit of risk. Um, in my mind, it's not an unsafe risk because we've seen it year in and year out. 
Um, but it is, and therefore I didn't go all the way to 225 or 230. I stopped at 200 is what I would recommend. And, uh, and that's, it's probably a fair thing to do if the alternative is to cut programs, right? Now, just it's a more, a little bit more aggressive in our budgeting. So I hope that's logical to everybody. But I uh, met with Rosa and with John and with Ken, and I said, guys, we ought to put in front of the board that we can do this, and we can do it reasonably safely, even though it doesn't exactly match the P times Q um, that, that we build the bottoms up budgets on. Um, so that's, uh, that's that first hundred and 20,000, because right now we're budgeted at an 80,000 assumption, and if this would take us up more to closer to 200. Now, I wouldn't have done that knowing what our history has been on how we've used those underruns on, uh, without the discussion that the Board of Finance had on special education. They've asked that we build our budget straight up based on what we know, right? So we know that the uh, um, that the uh, you know the the list of students that we have and who we're going to drop off next year, who will continue, and we had actually added three hundred thousand dollars of contingency to our budget. The last night's board of finance meeting, and I don't know if any of you had a chance to watch that. They sat and debated that, and uh, they basically would have said uh, rather than having us budget maybe a little more conservatively on the salary line to be able to cover risk and also add contingency to our, our uh, special ed budget in order to cover risk, that they would actually ra have us budget those at the level we think, based on what we know today, that those numbers will be. They recommended we take a contingency out of the special ed line and be a little bit more aggressive and try and call the ball on the salary line. And that, that what they will do is put contingency, uh, a broader contingency at the town level. And if we do have a special education issue, that they would be there for us, right? And they're assuring us they will be there for us. Um, and uh, and that uh, that they would try and carry a broad off of the broader base that they have some contingency. And in fact, tonight what they're doing is they're meeting on the capital budget, and they're intending to actually back off on the capital items for town and schools, uh, hold that money in a contingency bucket. If it looks like we need that for special ed we would spend it on special ed, but if, for, if, it, if it works for us, and it seems like every other year it's fine, and the, the in between we seem to have big problems, but if it works, if we don't need it, they can then initiate, you know, move it back into capital and do the capital projects. So it's a logical thing for them to do, to say, I can make decisions on capital a little bit more fluidly, uh, because we tend to do those capital projects during the summer anyhow, um, and, uh, I, and I'd rather hold that money as contingency and then we'll decide how we'll use it. Either we'll use it for special if that's an issue or we'll, or we'll put it back on capital instead. So it's a logical thing that they're working on. So the big gorilla items that John started his conversation with, the two biggest ones were uh, take an aggressive stance on salary and take the contingency amount out of our special ed budget. And they kind of went together in the discussion. Um, the, uh, the third one is just an update, right, from the, from the insurance provider. So that one is actually a given, and we ought to, we ought to go ahead and just book that. Um, but, the, uh, but those two are, I needed to explain a little bit in the background. So, Rose, I'll turn it back, the floor back to you and see if anybody wants to react to that. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Um, I actually agree with you, um, not only through our conversations and the really extensive analysis that you provided, but I do think that we could probably safely take a bigger risk on the salary turnover. Um, I just want everybody to understand sort of what that does to our operations going forward. So the very real risk that we're taking is not only 
in that salary line item, but if we are consistently having special education related overruns, it does leave us in with disability to solve those issues or mitigate any part of that issue. So we would have to go directly to the Board of Finance before you know being able to really take any steps on our own. So that's just something I wanted to sort of, you know, I agree with everything Bob said. We just have to be aware of not only the budgetary risk, but the operational risk as well. So um, I'm just going to pick someone else to kind of put on the list that I can give everybody a turn. So Joy, do you have any comments, questions, or reactions? No, I, I support, you know, the decision you, you are recommending. I don't have any questions about it. Okay. Um, Debbie, if you're, I don't see your, your video on here, but if you're still there, if you have any questions, comments, or reactions to um, Dr. Burrell's recommendations or anything that Bob or I have said. Um, I guess I, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I guess I'm a little uncomfortable with the, the recommendation for the special ed contingency only because um, I guess I, I guess I wonder what's the guarantee that the money will be there if we need it. Um, I understand why they're asking us to do that. Um, but I think, you know, I guess because we're, we're sort of living it now, asking them for an overage for this year, and it feels like we're struggling a little bit to get that. So I wonder what it will be like next year if we have to go through it again. Okay, that's fair. Mm -hmm. um, Jen, are you still there? So does this leave, I just wanted to ask, does this leave, we, so we have no extra in the special budget? Yes, that's correct. Okay. okay, so we have for like what we know coming into next year. Yep. So, so if I may, Amy, I really appreciate yep. that question. If I can for just a second, I want to reiterate what Rosa said. While logically this all makes sense, um, the, the overage that we came forward with publicly back in October, the overage in special education, was above and beyond what we were already handling in-house with known, I don't want to call it extra money, but it was the underrun from the salaries. That's where we, we mm -hmm. solved the problem on our own in-house. To, right. to Rose's early point in this discussion, that ability will be drastically curtailed to handle anything in-house on our own. As soon as we go over, if we don't have contingency um, and we are aggressive on our salary underrun, as Bob uh, described for us, we are going to have, have to ask the Board of Finance for help if we have any, uh, uh, any uh, thought uh, through our analysis that we are going to be over. So that just needs to be crystal clear for everybody to know. And I, fact, I, uh, well, I will say that when this was brought up by the Board of Finance, the first thing I said to them was, this year we had a $900,000 exposure and in the end, you're funding um, uh, 280 or 208, I guess. Um, and uh, we covered uh, the yeoman share of it through underruns on other lines. And, uh, and you would end up having to deal with all 900K. And they agreed that that's exactly what they would expect. So, and I also, I also will add that this was questioned by the Board of Finance members, not which was going to the Senate here, but that was questioned by a few Board of Finance members. And hey, Ro Rosa, can you hold, Rosa, can you hold on? We're having a sound thing. Bob, can you try to turn your mic off for a second? Okay, that's better. Okay, that's, Thanks, Rosa. That's better. Okay. Yeah, so yes, it was um, something similar was questioned by another board of finance member last night, and you know the question was if the board of ed comes to us with a much bigger ask and much earlier in their year, 
you know, where are we going to get the money from? And that was still a very real topic of discussion, whether or not the town even has places to cover some of these potentially larger, you know, if this were to happen again next year, you know, our ask would be, you know, a lot higher. And yet, like Bob said, you know, it'd be 500,000 to $900,000. So um, it's something to consider when we are essentially putting forth or what we're doing with our budget. Um, Rosa, can I, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. So yeah, so that's my big concern as, as everyone else has stated. And I remember Steve Dunn was very concerned about um, not putting um, anything out to the voters, you know, to go beyond what was internal because that would impact our, um, our financial rating, if I'm remembering the conversation correctly. Um, so, and then, so, and Bob, can you just explain, just so we have crystal clear, so why does it make better financial sense for the town to have that in their budget versus us, just so I understand that? Because they can make trade offs against capital. We can't. Okay. Oh, because the capital budget is on the town side. We don't have our own capital budget. Okay. 100% on the town side. Okay. No, I get it. Uh, to, just to be frank, I would prefer to have that contingency in our budget. I mean, mm -hmm. I, it's a matter of course. But contingency is an interesting thing, right? Uh, when you're asking for, uh, when, when, so we got two things. We're asking for 6.5% increase year on year, and part of that's contingency. That is difficult. And then secondly, when you're looking at an $800,000 reduction to that number, um, it is, uh, you've got to think about, it. do you really want to um, carry contingency or do you want to partner with the Board of Finance to have them do it in a different way? So I think that's the things we need to think about. And between us guys, I'd love to have that contingency in our budget, but I don't think we can do that and meet $800,000 without cutting programs. Okay, I understand. And I think just one other piece I'd like to say, and, and I think Rosa mentioned it from part of the conversation last night, that the Board of Finance was talking about if the board comes to us, and it was just one of many things discussed, but if the Board of Ed comes to us earlier in their year, uh, this was reported as a significant financial concern in October. You can't get much earlier in the year than October. New students move in in September, um, and we get the students, we do the financials, and at the October meeting, we provided an update that this was a concern. So um, it, it's hard to do it earlier than October, and I just want to make that, again, just clear so everybody understands um, you know, the, 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 the context in which we work. Okay, uh, Mike, are you still there? If you are, do you have any questions or comments, reactions? Okay, I, didn't want, I didn't want to be a bother uh, with, the, uh, with the mic because I got noisy kids in the background. Uh, so, uh, well, let's, let's touch on some of the good things Bob said. He said a lot of bad things. Uh, so the 120 number here on the tier one is going to look more like a 200, so that's eighty thousand dollar difference. So I mean that that looks nice because that looks like it wipes out tier three, or maybe we can throw back, uh, maybe take some out of tier three and, and bring back uh, professional development, which uh, I I would prefer that as an option, uh, bringing professional development back in that 20 grand there, and then finding a reduction in uh, find that reduction in in the tier three. Uh, uh, yeah, the special education outplacement continue. That is a uh, uh, that is a that's a tough um, subject. Obviously, I, I get why we'd want the contingency. Uh, Bob, I think did you say that our budget is six and a half percent year on year in year out? Because I, I I saw it as in the threes. No, our budget request was six point seven percent. No, that that was this year. That was well, last year. Well, Years, years prior, it's never been that high. Oh, no, we've never. This is the biggest year-to-year uh, -year increase in spending that we've ever had. And part of the reason, I mean, let's be, let's be very straightforward. Um, part of the reason was because we have increased enrollment. 
and part of the increase this year in next year's budget was because the exposure on special ed that we have this year actually continues to next year and it wasn't in this year's budget and therefore it all shows as year-to-year growth so the the 6.7 percent the underlying spending increase is um, I think with this cut, it's actually less than three um, percent. But right. the uh, but the but the impact to the taxpayers is is, is I think with even with the cuts with Mr. Dunn, it's sitting at five percent. Right. So, yeah, five percent would be great. I mean, from I mean, I know six point seven is five percent is a lot than six point seven, but five percent, I think that would be. Uh, that would be great at this, you know, looking, looking at the numbers we're looking at. Uh, but that's 871,000 cut we're trying to solve. That's what you have to achieve to get to the, to get to 5%. Right. As I said, the 5, 5%, I mean, that, that, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's still a lot higher than, than years past. And it's, it's nice that we can, it looks like we can find a way to actually get there. I mean, we're, I know that, that's a big concession on the contingent I totally agree with you. Um, uh, I had a question on, uh, so I, I didn't look at the last week's meeting, sorry, uh, yesterday's meeting, I, I did watch uh, the meeting prior. Um, what did, did uh, was there ever a list provided on those line items? They said, I, I know they said over 200 line items. I, I know there's like uh, kind of a, um, that was a bone of contention, I know, because it's not really 200 line items because it's for school and all that. Uh, did we get a list of that? Questions. You mean the ones where Mr. Dunn said we were over the budget? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like he said there was like a lot of little lines. Did we, did we, did no, we no, no, there is not a lot of little lines. Uh, I, I actually spent time with, uh, uh, with Mrs. Marion today. Um, I will, let me tell you what, so what Mr. Dunn said at the meeting last Wednesday was where we were over our budget in uh, over 100 line items. Um, and it was kind of, he was talking like measurements, you know, you know, kind of the implication was you guys aren't managing against your budget. Well, I went back and of course we've never seen that. Um, and, uh, somebody had come up with an analysis. And so today I got the analysis and there was a, I, I found the report. First of all, they were talking about 2018, 19, some historical view. It was not a current year or next year type of view of things. Uh, secondly, there was an error in the spread they, they showed up that, that spreadsheet showed 133 individual budget items and, and an individual budget item was a line item like we look at budgets, but at a school level. So they had uh, a, a whole bunch of line items that uh, the town controller had pulled reports on. And it turns out that there was she her report said there was 133 line items that were over. Well, I looked at the spreadsheet, there was a math error in the spreadsheet, and the number wasn't 133, it was 70. And of the 70, 40 were salary lines, which are not, they're managed by the headcount we have, not, uh, not by the thing. So there were only like 30 lines at an individual level that um, may have been over the budget with, that we had done in that year. And I started going through those lines and some of them were like electricity, right? And you know what? We spent more electricity because we had more cold days. It, it is what it is and can manage that stuff. So I'm not overreacting to that set of data that they threw out there and were flinging around at that meeting. It doesn't, none of it made sense. It's not that we shouldn't go look at it and use that as a management system, but that set of data was flawed and old so i'm i think we got to go ken i think we need to go spend time looking at the uh, our measurements process to kind of adopt some of the thinking there but uh but uh michael i definitely would not overreact to that discussion. no i'm not overreacting. i just want a clarification and you definitely uh you brought them uh so so the real number is 30 lines it's 30 lines and, and half of those 30 lines were things that are going rate type things right. and it was not even from this year it was from prior years i think the question is does the board of finance recognize the adjustment that it's 30 lines and not 100 lines yes um yeah. not yet 
I, I just did that analysis late this afternoon, Debbie, and I'm going to send a note to them. Okay. Thanks. I wanted to give I wanted to give Mrs. Marion a chance to respond to my uh, my findings before I sent it to the Board of Finance. And Bob has been going back and forth with um, Marsha and some of the Board of Finance members, but keep in mind that scrutinizing the budget to that level is our job. That's what we are supposed to do. And that's what I think we do, not only in this process, but throughout the entire year. And maybe for some of the newer board members, once you've been on a year, you'll sort of see that happening. So, um, you know, it's, it's just important that, you know, you communicate to other boards and to the public that that is what the public elected us to do. And that is, I think, what we do very well, actually. So, um, yeah, my point is I just saw the meeting and I, I you, know, we, you know, we talked about this yesterday, but uh, the, the underlying context was kind of um, what I was kind of looking for. Um, you know, just I, I didn't want to skip over the, the point that that Dunn, that uh, Mr. Dunn made. Uh, and my, my last uh, my last kind of question, I feel like I had more, but I'll, I'll just go one more. Uh, it was for Ken. Did, did uh, I discuss the uh, the uh, life insurance went up six thousand dollars this year is that an accurate number we're projecting it to go up next year yes now, that's six thousand dollars you're talking about is from the prior year yeah so yeah. so it's true the that it went up two hundred dollars two hundred dollars and six thousand dollars it's based on our current rates and our current population plus the, the folks we're projecting to add in the budget that seems like a huge jump uh okay um that's, that's all I got for now. Okay. And I will just, you know, just sort of reacting to what you were saying, Mike, you know, it's 5% is a lot compared to last year, but that doesn't feel like 5% to us when we have these very necessary increases that are related to things that are not um, improvements. They're really just sort of keeping things as they are. So that's a necessary sort of thing to keep in mind that oh, oh, totally agree. That, five percent is actually it feels like a cut. Um, I, no, I, I, and I, I totally agree. And we discussed that. Uh, uh, you, know, you and I discussed that yesterday. Uh, but you know, for now, I mean, you know, putting some information forward, I, I think it's we have to work with the special ed department, special ed uh, teachers, to really expand our special ed program so we keep some of these kids uh, in district because. Um, this 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 can't you know we're we're going to be dealing with this problem. I think Deb mentioned this before. We're going to be dealing with this problem every year uh, if if something doesn't. Well, we have unique we have unique problems this year, and I'm sure as you know you sort of once you spend a little more time um, you know with some of these district leaders, you'll we'll see that these are not problems that are consistent. The 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 nature of special education and the needs of students is very dynamic and changing and um, yeah, never gone that, down. That, yeah, yeah. But that's not only our trend, that's the trend right. sort of right. nationwide. We, we need to, uh, you know, after when this budget thing is done, I mean, I think we have to put a lot of focus on, you know, and, and take uh, account a lot of the, the special educator administrators and teachers how do we, you know, uh, maybe from some other boards? How do we, how do we get this, uh, that thirty, like what, thirty-six special ed outplacement that we have now, something like that, mm -hmm. to be tested? I think. How do we get that number down to, you know, below thirty? I mean, that'd be like a, you know, that'd be like a decent goal. Yeah, I mean, bringing in house programs, programs is something. But, bringing know, special education programs in house is definitely something that, you know, you will see. We definitely work on. So. Yeah. But still being a new and dynamic thing, I'm just, you know, like I said, you know, for right now, we got to get this, we got to get this budget passed and then uh, live the fight another day. Um, but, that's yeah, I, but I agree with Michael. Um, I think we ought to set a goal that we want to get the number of outplaced kids down into the 20s, right? And then say, how do we drive our work so that we can get there? I think it's it's a it's an appropriate thing for us as a board to, to try and drive. In fact, <laughs> In the, in the end, the reality is the reality. If we don't have a program, we're going to end up having to do the right thing for the kids. Exactly. But as we drive strategic effort, I think setting a, setting a target that says 
we want to make a healthy dense is not a bad target as a board that we do. And it doesn't have to be a precise target, but it could be uh, we want a 30% reduction. What's it going to take to do that, right? What do we have to, well, what, do we need to do investments? Is it even possible? I, I don't know. I don't know about you guys. I have no idea. Um, I, I hear what you're saying, but I think we have to be careful when we talk about setting a specific number that we want to reach. We, what we need to understand, I think, is what types of tre treatments or services or programs are students receiving who are outplaced, and how does our outplacement compare to other districts? Um, and I think John was going to try to get that number um, from some other superintendents. And I know a ton it, of stuff. It's publicly, it's publicly available. Uh, I forgot the website, but uh, a teacher patient of mine. Uh, Debbie, I actually, De <laughs> Debbie, G Gina, Gina yeah. Wigonic actually talked with uh, Derg B special education directors and, and does have that number. Unfortunately, I do not have that with me tonight. I can tell you, yeah. in generally speaking, we are ex very comparable with what um, you know the other comparable towns are uh, are experiencing. But um, we can get you that number. And I well, just—I mean, Danbury's got 57, and we have 36. Danbury is definitely more than twice the size of us. So I'd say, and, and, I mean, yeah. Danbury, I disagree on that. Yeah, Mike. What I'd like to tell you there is this: this is a a longer conversation specifically about special education okay. program. Danbury, um, being the um, larger district, has um, the ability to set up in-house programming. We actually take advantage of that with Danbury, and we work together uh, collaboratively, and we actually save lots of dollars um, in working with Danbury. Uh, don't forget, during this conversation, um, before Mrs. Wigonic took over for Dr. Sapala, we had already started to build in therapeutic programming, Huckleberry, Wiskineer, and the high school. What we had this year, this frankly, this enigma year, was uh, students um, so profound that they were not able to remain in even our therapeutic programming in the schools. So it is not for lack of effort. In addition, um, as part of my role as the area chair for the Western Connecticut Superintendent Group in working with our regional efficiencies, one of our major goals that's already there is to work with Ed Advance, our local uh, regional educational service center to bring kids closer and under more control local control that do need uh, those significant um, uh, services outside of the school however it would give us more control and we pool our resources with our neighboring districts so we are already working toward that we would love to bring that number down we just had a very very uh, uh, dynamic year I'll just leave it at that and I think we're, we might be getting just a little bit off topic. I'm going to bring it back to the discussion of um, the budget for next year. So, Amy, um, did you have any sort of reactions or questions regarding the list that Dr. Brill provided? Not really, no. I already asked, you know, about the outplacement. I mean, I'm certainly don't love to not have that contingency, but I think it's the right call rather than something that directly impacts our kids and our programs. Okay. So not, I love everything looks, looks okay. good. Um, well, then I will, I will go with sort of my initial reactions and questions. So um, I'm looking at the sheet that you provided and, and, and on the top under necessary additions, this, these aren't our only necessary additions, right? I mean, we have increases in a lot of other areas like special ed tuition and transportation and things these are items that were identified after we put the budget together yep. okay um the only thing that i would right off the bat sort of change is i would like to not touch that pd that's in tier two and maybe increase our salary turnover in what you have written down for tier one um not entirely sure how i feel about the special education outplacement contingency um i think you know we have been told by the board of finance to budget what we feel is appropriate and if we are consistently overrunning certain budget items we should budget for something bigger and so i think that's what we've done here um so i don't really understand the point of 
taking that away, knowing that we'll have to ask for it back, other than the simple release of control. Um, other than that, um, these other things, so the building maintenance, I'm talking looking in tier two, so the pre-K tuition, the building maintenance. Can I just ask um, about the building maintenance? What does that um, consist, what would that cut out? That's just, that? It's not really cutting anything out, it's just looking at the historical spending in that account and it's been lower than what we budget every year. So I'm just adjusting the budget to reflect the- uh, Okay, reality. so I think that was, that's part of my question. So I'm, I'm wondering, so are these, are these things that we are sort of conceding a little bit on or are these things that um, I guess maybe should have been in the budget for that amount initially? Uh, I, I think, Ken, if I may, I think with the building maintenance, for example, we, we have to remember, and this is something that's easy to forget, we have a third maintenance position that we haven't filled now for two years. We don't have the maintenance capacity to do everything we would like to do. So part of this is also um, Dan and one other um, maintenance worker at this point um, just can't get to everything either. So just like we have um, actuals, that uh, folks look at and analyze and wonder why we're budgeting more than the actuals. Well, that's because of budget freezes. In some areas, like in maintenance, there is just lack of capacity to do certain things. It's no secret, uh, Joy, I, I understand why you would ask the question. You're the chair of our facilities committee. Um, you know, not everything is picture perfect in our schools. And, and frankly, that's why we're, we're building a brand new elementary school. So um, the, these are some of the issues that I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because that's really, at the end of the day, that's really, you know, as we look historically, we just can't get to everything and we do the best we can with the people we have. And we're trying to make the budget work and stay as far from students as possible. Everything affects students, but I'm, I'm you know, we're between a rock and a hard place what? trying to make so for this the work. So for the social studies PD, is that something we're scaling back on or we're just not doing any social studies PD? Well, you know what? Dr. Ruby's been very quiet this evening, so I'll let Dr. Ruby weigh in in the instructional department. I'll turn on our microphone. There you go. Dr. Ruby, are you there? Hey, she I think she left Get back she, in now. Oh, okay. She bounced out. Oh. So um, we've all been asked to look at what we're doing and try to scale back, and so... You know, the teachers, uh, the, the extended duty um, account is always being looked at and questioned. And so um, Deb Farias and I just decided that uh, we would have to not engage the teachers and PD for teachers working with social studies um, and cut that and just um, do it ourselves. And that's not really what we want to do because we want the teachers to own the curriculum. We don't want to do curriculum and hand it to them, but um, we're, we're kind of between a rock and a hard place. We need to get the curriculum done. Um, we need to collaborate and, and give up just like everybody else is giving up things that they need. And so that was just the decision that we made. I don't know if that's really the answer you're looking for, but basically that's what it came down to. Okay. Not training teachers, not engaging the teachers in the social studies um, curriculum development, and just us doing it as catch as catch can on our own and then um, delivering it to them. It's going to take longer. It's, um, it's not going to have teacher voice and teacher engagement um, in it, um, but we need, to, we need to align our social studies curriculum with the standards and we need to have um, vertical alignment. We have a lot of repetition in uh, the curriculum that's being delivered to um, students now, particularly in the lower grades. And the lower grade teachers don't have, you know, every grade, it doesn't make any difference what grade level you teach. If you talk to high school teachers, you know, they have it hard. If you talk to middle school teachers, they have it hard. If you talk to elementary teachers, they have it hard. But the bottom line is it's a hard job. Everybody has it hard. And so, um, the elementary teachers do not have the type of um, release time and PLC time as say the high school teachers do. And the, the middle school teachers don't have as much as the high school, but somehow because of the age groups that they're working in, the way the schedules are set up, they're able to get more 
in school time to collaborate, whereas the elementary teachers just don't have that. So um, that's really all I can tell you about that. We just decided we had to cut something and that was it. So Maureen, <coughs> yep. does this mean you'll focus on only part of the social study curriculum? Like will you look at K to four or K to five and K five. K five because we have we have some um, other plans. Of course they all just basically went to hell with the, the situation we're in now. Um, we had things worked out where um, our middle school teachers, we, uh, I wrote a grant and we had some stuff going, that's all on hold. But we're hoping that once we get through this um, bump in the road, we'll be able to pick up on that again. And the high school teachers um, um, have a different situation because they're working on, as you know, um, really course coursework as, um, you know, individual courses as compared to grade level um, um, vertically um, articulated stuff that has to be aligned with very new standards for elementary teachers because the social studies um, curriculum framework and C3 framework um, really tap into very specific things that our elementary social studies curriculum for the past several decades wasn't hitting on. Um, it was like you studied geography, but you weren't studying civics and geography and history and economics uh, all in each each grade level. And so that's a big that's a big lift for um, folks who haven't done that before. So we're just going to cut it out and um, and do it um, in the curriculum office, which is not really the most ideal way to do it, but we have to get it done. Okay. Um. I'd like to continue uh, my questions on some of these tier two reductions. Um, again, I'm not comfortable with the professional development. I'd rather take a bigger risk if we're, if we're sort of in a position where, and we are um, forced to sort of do that. I would rather take a bigger risk than uh, miss out on some of this professional development. Um, my next question is about the pre-K tuition. So when do we, know about those final numbers and um, you know how come we're looking at sort of a an addition that we didn't anticipate before well that's really based on the fact that <clears throat> we saw an increase in the tuition income this year so I'm projecting it to continue next year and is there a reason in particular that we saw this increase this year more kids going full week and full year Okay. Um, and sorry, building and maintenance is something that we're we're just cutting back on because we we actually just don't have the staff at the moment to do it. So we're just booking a smaller number. Correct. Yeah, yes, and, and and we looked at the actual uh, you know the history and we based it on that. Okay. Um, IPDP. What is that? That that we call that Ippy Dippy. That is the professional development uh, 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 fund. <laughs> Do you want to jump okay. in, Maureen? Yeah, it stands for Individual Professional Development Plans. And so in our um, contract, our teacher's contract, there um, there's $20,000 that is uh, put aside for, this is different from the type of professional development that we do um, within the curriculum office. It's for it, teachers can individually, something that they personally as an individual feel that they need to enhance their personal skill set related to their job can apply for funds. We have a committee and every month on the third, I think it's the third Tuesday, my brain isn't quite working today. Um, it's on, uh, so many things going on, but I, that we um, have the committee review the applications and there are criteria that they have to meet and teachers are allowed up to apply for um, up to $700 per teacher at, until the money runs out um, for individual professional development plans. Um, and it just runs the gamut of uh, a variety of things that they really feel that they, and they make a case in their application for why they um, are seeking the, to do this particular um, program or, or course or workshop. And it gets, um, 
approved at the building level before the application can come to the committee and then the committee reviews it and then based on what the and that's made up of teachers and administrators um the, we make our decision on whether it meets all the criteria and is appropriate and and inform the teacher now the other interesting thing that we implemented when we came into district was if you got approved for this you um before you got your reimbursement for um for the the, the fees that we approved you need to submit a we have a, a powerpoint template on what you learned and you need to also submit um and eric um, really helps us with this your uh, any handouts that you got and that gets uploaded into a teacher website where other teachers can um, access what your learning was okay thank you yeah now, the, I the kind of um, experiences I would imagine we would want for our teachers especially if they're being um, they're initiating and, and exploring these options themselves we want to encourage that in any way we can so can um, I add something can yeah. I add to that when we when we interview teachers when we go through final interviews one of the um, hallmark um, questions that we get when we're interviewing finalists is um, when they ask about you know the district they we say at the end of the interview is there anything that you'd like to ask us you know etc and I would say 80% of the time or more we get asked what type of professional development do you offer and mm -hmm. I personally when we have candidates in um, you know uh, content areas subject areas um, specialties that are hard to fill I I would just say my personal opinion I find that I, I put that on the table right away as part of the professional note that we have this individualized professional development plan that's part of our teacher contract because I find that to be um, something that's very desirable by by the type of people that we want to have work here it speaks to me personally as to what the what the person is all about if they're looking to find out I can get a job any place I'm a math teacher what what do you offer in this district in terms of professional development I, I that's just personally I think that is a, um, a a good thing to be able to offer and it's um, I know that we're these are tough times it's twenty thousand dollars it's part of the teacher contract and you know I guess you can see my personal feelings about that yeah, yeah. No, I definitely agree. Can you ask a follow-up about that, Rosa? Yeah. So, um, on average, how much of the twenty thousand dollars is used? And then my second question is: So, is this something that the teacher union voluntarily offered, or we asked them to offer it? I asked the teacher union what um, their feeling would be about that, and okay. um, they were willing to uh, put that on the table as a as a contribution to to. To the efforts of trying to make this budget work. Okay. And and do we use all twenty thousand dollars on an average year? Like Ken, what Ken's looking. Jen, Ken is looking right now. Okay. Let me see if I can look it up. The, I don't. We don't use it all up. No. Mm -hmm. We don't expend the entire twenty thousand, but he can try to find it. Uh, okay. This morning, like, do we use half? Do we use three quarters? Of yep. the we'll find it. Okay. Uh, while he's looking for that, maybe John, you can answer the next question about the part-time clerical. Is do you have um, sort of any idea? I know you can't really talk like specific positions, but um, you know, is that something at a building level or? No, that's that's here at central office, and okay. so we we had a retirement, and one of our newer folks who is still with us is taking the. Uh, place of the individual who retired which now vacates the newer person's position and okay. um, we think that uh, with the skill set the experience and technology um, we can replace the vacated position uh, with a part-time unaffiliated person who we'd obviously train um, but that would save us not only on hours and, and certainly time which would mean uh, compensation in terms of pay but somebody who's part-time would not qualify for health benefits either and that's why you get such a significant save there and uh, okay i was able to look no, up in, oh, oh. in 1819 we yeah, spent five thousand and eighty four dollars and 1718 was 1930. we so it's we, certainly not fully utilized we spent that much um, yeah we, we spent that much so say yes. that again ken 
the spending for the Ippy Dippy money in 1819 was $5,084 of the 20 that was allocated. And the year before was 1930 Oh, so that's actually really low. Yeah. And this $20,000 reduction, it did, I'm sorry, you may have said this already, but does that, um, what does that sort of take that fund down to? Zero. It's, it's only twenty thousand dollars. That's what's contractually okay, so obligated. Like, so would we just be getting rid of that for one year. We would make. We would uh, presuming that the 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 a final agreement could be reached with the teacher union. They were willing to initiate this, and I let the, uh, uh, Mr. Quaz know that the union president that I'd be talking to the board about this this evening. So presuming we can make this work uh, in this reduction, if this is where the board uh, agrees to go. Um, we would reduce the entire 20,000. That was the plan. Okay. Okay. For one year. Um, and my last question on that one was the paying the lunch monitors out of the lunch fund. How come we weren't doing that previously? We, I'll let Ken talk to this. We only recently yeah. became, became aware that we were allowed to. Okay. And we do have a surplus in the lunch fund that we'll be able to do this for several years. And Ken, can you talk a little bit about the percentage, just so people have an idea how that works? And, and the monitors, you know, their role isn't just monitoring, they also monitor recess, they right. do other things, they so how that works? Also. So we can only use the lunch fund money to pay for time that they actually monitor the cafeteria. Yep. So we're doing about 25% okay. of their time. We don't, want to, we don't want to drain the fund, for one thing, and uh, just supplement what we're doing. Okay, so there's still money in the lunch fund for Plenty. other things that we need it for absolutely we don't want to be overly okay. aggressive in that area because the lunch fund um is is comes out of the the uh the additional monies that are uh, made through students paying for lunch so this isn't uh, operational money it is not taxpayer money um and there's very strict guidelines through the national food service program of how uh, those uh, funds are expended uh, and we have used the funds from the lunch account to pay for uh, new ovens and hoods and things to outfit our kitchens and, and, and update them. Digital, so it's digital signage in the oh uh, the, the digital signage that's now cafeterias. in the cafeteria with the menus and things like that. So there's there's a lot of great things that can be done that the taxpayers don't have to pay for. We don't have to put it in the operational budget because we could use the lunch funds to help with our kitchen and cafeteria areas. And we wanted to do this funding uh, at a level that we would be able to continue year after year as, as opposed to spending a lot of money one year and then having to put all of that back into the operating budget the next year. Okay. Uh, what I would actually then suggest um, is I would like to keep the Amanda Aaron's PD, the Social Studies PD, and $5,000 in the Ippy Dippy Fund um, and then increase the salary turnover risk to 175 I don't know how everybody else feels about that. Whoa, 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 whoa. We already have 8000 in the budget. Oh, understand that uh, that 120 that's on Ken's sheet takes it from 80 to 200 We already, oh. we already have 80 built in. I this is an additional 120 Okay. Yeah, you, you, you are already taking a healthy risk. I think trying to use more of that fund you know, to take it above 200 we're starting no, to... No, 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 yeah. Okay. So, oh, that, so that, that was, that was, that was different from where we were, not the total. I see. Okay. Um, yeah. I would definitely like to uh, keep the, you know, the PD, the two PDs in there. I don't know how we can then, we got to figure out, I mean, I suppose we don't have to, we got to figure out what that might be. But I think right now, I think my initial reaction, yes, yeah, to keep the PD. Maybe not all of the um, IPDP fund, but I'd like to keep some of that in there. I think at least the social studies and the... Um... Yeah, for sure. I think the way we've got to think about it is um, this tier three is, I guess I would describe that, John, as, as not yet resolved. 74,000. Yeah, that's, that's so a good, good way to describe it. If we're it. putting money, if we want to put money back on some of these, it just increases the size of the not yet resolved. Right? That's how we ought to think about it. Right. So we got 74K that they got to continue to work on. 
we want him to go work on 100k so we can put in some more things that's just it just makes the the, the challenge that much harder yeah. um also i wonder and i i mean i i see the value in keeping the ten thousand dollars for the pd but considering kind of like what's happened this spring and all the things you have to deal with my question to maureen is do you, do you really have the time to have teachers work for ten thousand dollars worth of social studies pd next year like is that a, a reality or it, are there are there efforts going to have to be placed elsewhere just because of what's happened this spring Did I lose Maureen? I think Maureen's phone's on mute. Yeah, she's there. It's just on mute. Yeah. Um, that month. So just for clarification, that money. Um, and I'm not. I'm not saying that you said this. I just wanted to clarify. That's not um, extended duty money. That's for paying um, a a person to come in that we had. Um, that we're going to identify to come in to work with teachers. Oh, okay. So that's the staff developer. Yeah. Okay. So do you still feel like with all that happened in, you know, the spring and what we don't, you know, yet know, is it important that we, you know, have that staff developer? Is it timely? Is it worth keeping in the budget uh, versus cutting something out from your opinion, in your opinion? Uh, if we're of any professional development, that's really the only professional development that I think we're in a position to let go. And it's not, I, I think uh, there are enough people around that know how I feel about the importance of social studies, but the reality is it's not an assessed subject at this point in time. And we have the other subject areas that um, we are still in the process and have a way to go. So that's why Deb and I looked at this and said, how can we get all this work done? What can, what can we let go of and what can we take on ourselves? And that, that was it. So it had, it, it's not something that can be let go. It just has to be done in another way, which having two people sit down and write curriculum for five grades without the um, inclusion of the people who are doing it, it, as you know, is not best practice. But it has to be. We have to get the work done. Anybody else have thoughts right now? I just wanted to follow up on a suggestion or a question I had last meeting, which was to see if there were any savings if we move to a 180-day school year instead of 182. And I know today in this moment, that's probably not something we should consider <laughs> based on what we're going through right now and how many school days we're missing. But I'm just curious if there, if we made any headway on that. We did, Deb. Or, oh, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, or bouncing off that, how much we're saving by not using busing right now. Yeah, so. Or how much we potentially save. Yeah, so so I, I'll answer Joy's question first. I. I Ken was asked that question uh, either late last week when when this pandemic started to strike us and we made the call to cancel school. There were already people uh, wondering and asking us that while we were trying to handle the emergency situation. They were looking to see what we could save this year. Um, so while that's important, I told Ken that's a Thursday problem. We had to manage the students, keep everybody safe, serve lunches, get devices out, and then prepare for a big budget discussion tonight. So we don't have an answer on what we could save, but big pieces, certainly, Joy, you're right, transportation. Um, depending on d discussions and decisions that are made in the future, um, you know, there's all, there's all kinds of things that aren't happening now, and we don't know what the future holds in terms of will we ever come back this year? We just don't know. So we are gonna have to analyze that, and it's gonna be a great discussion, so thank you for asking that. The Debbie's question, um, Ken went through and analyzed what two days would look like. Um, and a matter of fact, again, talk about cooperation. You know, we talked about teacher union cooperation, working together across the, across the hall with the Board of Finance and Board of Selectmen. Um, he reached out to Mr. Dufour, who's uh, the owner of All Star Transportation. Um, now remember, we're contracted 
with All Star to pay them 182 days of, of transportation. He said um, if that was uh, something the board needed to do, he could back that off. That's around $23,000 for two days of transportation. Um, when you add in other contracted areas where we are not obligated um, to pay people um, that additional two days, there's language in contracts where they work as many days as the students do and they work, you know, that kind of a thing. When you add all that up, the savings on two days that we could guarantee that we wouldn't have to negotiate would be around $36,000. Because the teachers are paid 187, so are, are we going to negotiate to have them work two less days? Um, you know, there's, there's a lot that would have to go into that discussion, but um, without getting into negotiations with any of our bargaining units, and just going on what we can control and having worked with the bus company, saving, uh, taking two less days would save us um, $36,000. And personally, I don't think that's a value when you're thinking about um, taking out two days of valuable instruction. I don't think you can put a number on that, even though 36,000 sounds like a big number. I just wanted to make sure I got back to Debbie on that. She had asked me, so thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yep. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, my next question is, um, it's not, I'll admit, it's not really a fair question because I'm sure you ha don't have this prepared, John, but um, if we were to um, not want to remove that special ed contingency, you know, we're looking at another, you know, $400,000 or more. Um, if we left that contingency in place and we had a lower risk, you know, where would you predict, I guess, your next move or recommendation would be from. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we, we've talked this through a, as a group and um, trying to, again, go back to the beginning of the session, discussion, maintaining our goal of staying away from kids and things that might impact their program and keeping class size uh, at, the, at the board guidelines. Um, that's where it starts to impact. Right now, with this scenario we put forward, we have the first the the two first grade teachers you know in in uh for the extra sections um and, and you know the one first grade teacher based on enrollment the other first grade teacher based on enrollment moving a section from huckleberry to have the additional kindergarten so some of the new we might start to look at the new um enhancements um the uh, math interventionists at the high school which is a critical need uh, the monitors that we have for math uh, in the budget, we, we really, that's probably the first place we'd go. Um, but I'm going to tell you, I don't make these decisions in a vacuum. We have a tremendous team with a lot of expertise. Um, and we talked the other day about, um, with the exception of science fair, all the extracurricular activities at Huckleberry. That's an area we start, we have to start to look. Um, we may have to look, somebody brought up the idea of pay for play to, to bring some revenue back in to cover things. Um, we'd hate to do that. The middle school sports program, taking a look at that. And I don't say any of these things to be incendiary at all. Um, this is the reality. We start getting into programs and people, um, not only enhancements, those, those positions that aren't real people yet because they're not approved, they're, not, they're in the budget, but they're not people who are actually working for us or with us. Um, but we have to start looking there. Um, and we've got kids who have needs. Um, so we, we've, we've got to meet the needs of our kids and we have lots of valued and loved programs in this community that um, no one wants to lose. So those are the next places I'd go, Rosa, and we start to really examine that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, you know, so I guess, you know, this is just sort of a question, you know, to our board because obviously um, Dr. Brill and, and his team and Maureen, they've, they've based these recommendations on you know, our board goals and what they perceive our um, priorities at this juncture to be. So I just kind of want to see where everybody else stands in terms of your comfortability level with these recommendations as opposed to perhaps increasing class sizes or whatever it is, um, or if you need more information from John and Maureen, you know, to, to have that opportunity now to sort of ask those questions. Anybody jump in? Well, I think, I think obviously if we have to choose um, 
uh, between something and, you know, losing teachers and increasing class sizes. I think even though we're, we're going to lose control over the contingency, I think, you know, that's the thing I think we sort of have to do, even if we don't want to. So class sizes are, you know, important to you over maybe perhaps PD or something. Yes. Okay. Anybody else with other thoughts? Yeah, I, I had a uh, kind of just kind of a looking at the list over and over again and uh, considering the situation that we're in uh, to Deb's point on, on the last two that last days. Could we actually because I know we, we talked last night about how substitutes factor into that that salary line and how um, as, as of I think of now we're over two hundred thousand dollars on that salary line as, as far as a, a an overrun and Bob you, you can you can tell me if I'm wrong because like, you got you have all the numbers there but maybe we can take a bigger risk on that salary line and maybe save the, the those those professional development um, at least one of them or or if you want to split them in half and maybe we can uh, you know get some of those uh, professional development lines back in based off of we're probably going to be over. I mean, we, I, I would see, you know, if, if we're over 200 already, I mean, you know, we're, we're not going to go back to school till, you know, I, I'm, I'm hearing rumors, like not for the rest of the year. I mean, if that's the case, then, you know, we could, we could definitely take a bigger risk on that salary line. But it, that's for I'm, this year. I'm throwing up there. I don't know about it. Bob would know, know better than me. It's worth really a question for Bob. The savings that we see here because of the school closure, if there even are any, or that's this year not next year well isn't that the because we have the 200 for right now we're at the 200 we're over 200 right now and like i know we have to that's that's before adding subs in but i mean if we're continuing the current trends i mean we, we could easily set see that number over 300 so maybe a 220 maybe a, two, a 225 total wouldn't be so that's very that's very risky because and Bob can chime in here too, but that's incredibly risky considering um, we don't know what our leaves and vacancies are going to be next year. We can we can take a reasonable assumption on that, and I think that's where you know maybe increasing that risk to two hundred thousand is is relatively safe. But I think going above that, based on Bob's analysis, it starts getting very. Um, dangerous having to freeze because you overrun your salary line is not responsible at all. So, Bob, do you want to well, add? For, that? Right, but twenty-five thousand dollars. I'm I'm just saying, that, you know, if, if we're talking about cutting uh, programs or taking a risk, and then I mean, the, what, and then the, then the risk at the end is, hey, uh, Board of Finance, we, you know, we we try to be as aggressive as possible to keep these, you know, programs worth fighting for or worth. Uh, you know, uh, to what Maureen was saying, uh, they're very important. Uh, I totally agree with her. I mean, it, I know it's it, it's just I'm just asking for like maybe if we just call I, it, I, but I, I, let, let me chime in here because I yep. think there's a way we can work our way through this. Um, first of all, we don't need to make a final decision tonight, right? Let's. I think what we have to do is be comfortable enough to talk to the public during the upcoming public hearings, assuming we have them, um, about where our head is right now. But we actually don't need to vote on the final budget changes until after it passes at referendum in the month of May. Um, that gives us some important time. And the important time, the, the reason I would have stopped short at 200,000 in total is because Ken is not aware of anybody right now who has said they're going to retire, right? And about half of the savings we've been seeing have been the, what we call teacher turnover, you know, retirements, and then we'll do hiring in the summer. Um, John, when did teachers declare um, um, generally their actions? Yeah, it, it varies, um, but usually in February, um, our teachers start to notify us if they're planning to retire. And I've actually asked each principal to talk with their staff and, you know, put a communication out saying, you know, it's important in the budget development process. If you plan on retiring or thinking about it, please let me know. Please let HR know because it's a big, it's a big factor in our budget development. We, we really analyze that 
uh, as demonstrated tonight, we, we take a good look at that. So right now we don't have so, anyone. I've asked twice also. Yeah, and Ken, Ken well, himself I'm, has asked. I'm thinking between now and mid-May, we may or may not have more information on this, right? right. And right. Uh, and, but we'll definitely have more information than we have right this minute, right? And right. if we don't have a lot of retirements, I would be leaning into the lower end. If we do have retirements, uh, some number of retirements, it might be okay to take a little more risk. So I would just kind of say, let's hold on that yeah. and, and look at it again with a little more information. That would be point number one. Point number two is that the other discussion they had with the Board of Finance last night was, and they all agreed unanimously that um, that they uh, that if we were to underrun our spending this year, they would allow us to apply that underrun to next year. Um, and you know what, with the schools being closed, even for a couple of weeks, you know, there are things that we just don't spend, right? Things like, you know, we don't, we're not driving buses around, we're, uh, we're not heating the schools to the degree that we would have otherwise, we don't have substitutes, we're not having people doing a lot of overtime. I mean, there are things that want to underrun. And so to the extent that we can we, we can figure out what that is by May, or get a better sense of it, we might have a little bit of room to maneuver on that too. So I'm thinking the time from here on March 18th to the, the referendum is like May 15th, right? We've got, we've got two months to build up some better information on two fronts that, that will help us make a better final decision. So I'm thinking that what we could do right now, Rosa, is have a preliminary, this is the stuff we're looking at. You could communicate that in any public hearings that these are the things we're looking at. Um, it's still some unknowns, um, and depending on how things play out, we might swizzle that a little bit, right? Um, but it's not, you know, you're in about the right ballpark to be able to communicate to the public of what, you know, this $817,000 reduction means to us. So that's kind of, I'm thinking that's kind of how you play this out is you, 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 you know, when you make your final decisions, you have more information. Okay. Um, everything in tier one, my, my kind of question is, um, these are things obviously that are adjustments post the original construction of the budget. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, well, then I just I want to kind of go through just make sure everybody um, has gotten a chance to speak and ask any questions because this would be sort of the opportunity to if you have any major issues with it to kind of um, you know tell Dr. Brill to go search elsewhere in the budget. But um, does anybody have any questions or comments like that? Can I just get those numbers for the teacher turnover for the last couple of years? What the actual numbers were? It's in uh, Bob's analysis that um, he, we sent out. And I guess I'm part of the All right, I'll reference that. So, yeah. Anything else? I've got the numbers right here, so let me uh, let me just read them to you. And what these are, just so you know, are the amount of underspend in the salary budget offset by the amount of overspend in the substitutes budget. Because you know, when you have teachers out, you have to have substitutes, right? So I took the, I said those two things go together. So I just kind of netted them. So in the last three years. Um, this year we're projecting 234,000, which was 284 under on the salary budget offset by 49 overrun on substitutes. So 234K, last year was 226K, and two years ago was 476K. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like an anomaly to me. 
There's a lot of retirement yeah, homes that year. Right. 76 an anomaly, so there's no yeah. doubt. that We had a huge amount of retirements that year. Oh, I agree. Um, and we've, we've, always, and uh, we've always budgeted give or take $100,000, you know, 80000 in some years, 120000 in other years. So... Um, so we've been we've been doing more than we've been budgeting by about a hundred thousand dollars each year. So um, in the last two years at least. And what I'm recommending is we take our eighty up to two hundred. Which smart. and and I think we could do two twenty five if we have to, but I would want to see the retirees before I make that commitment to go to the next tier up. Agreed. Agreed. Especially because two years ago was only 226, so that's coming within a thousand dollars. That's a little too close for comfort. I agree with you. Yep. So where did we net out on the the PD? Do we have a decision, or we're just gonna the PD that's recommended for reduction? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as as it stands now, that's sort of where. You know where I was sort of asking you guys. You know, do you value PD more or do you value class sizes more? Because you know, according to what John has said, you know that's sort of the next place that you know we end up having to go. Okay. I personally value class sizes more. And that number on the ippy dippy again was we've only we haven't used more than five thousand for that. In the last two years, no. In actuality? In the last two years, we have not used more than 5000 in the last two years. I feel comfortable knocking that down from 20000 certainly. Well, we want that number to be big. But then yeah, that thousand wipes out. But it's an area where the teachers have said they'd, will, they'd be willing to forego it for a year, right? So it's not, in the end, it's, it's a short-term decision because we've got a big budget thing, and I think it's great that the teachers would agree to be part of the solution here yeah our teachers yeah. Have, our teachers have been fantastic I also think we remember bob's point we don't have to necessarily decide tonight about something no, that's no. ten thousand dollars you know like in another month we might have more information thank you jen no, and, we don't and, have to, and the other we point, don't have to I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm sorry. We, don't go ahead. Today. we just need to know. We just, John needs to know if there's other places that he needs to go looking if this list doesn't really work for any of us. And don't forget. You know what? I think, John, you ought to go look for $100,000 and then we can all make a decision. Yeah, this, I have to already look for $75,000. I'll be meeting with the leadership team. And so we'll, we'll instead of $75,000, we'll try to look for 100 and see if we can find it. I mean, we just keep going back and grinding away. Um, I don't want to overpromise. Necessity is the mother of invention, and we just keep working the problem and working the problem and working the problem. That's what we do. Um, that's what scrubbing the budget means, and we've got a great team. Um, but in the end, we're between a rock and a hard place. None of these decisions are fun decisions to make, and they hurt in some way. Everybody needs to understand that. Okay. Does anybody have any other comments on our budget? So I think what we said, just in terms of um, any savings that there might be this year because of kids being out of school, would we be able to use those funds for anything next year or it's two separate Things. Oh no! They said they said we could uh, have it as a non-lapsing fund, and that we, we could use it for next year. Okay. And so, like I said, we won't know that number hard, but we'll know better in two months where that look than we do right now. Yeah. We'll know. I mean, and I actually think there are the longer that this shutdown is. I mean, we have some. We have some decisions we have to make, I think, but the longer the shutdown is, the more likely we'll have some underruns. Mm -hmm. just, just on things that happen, right? You don't you don't go spend a lot of overtime pay or, or you're not sending people on travel for, you know, on trips right now. You're not, uh, you know, there's a lot of little lines that you're just not doing because you're not in school. Right. So, and uh, so, yeah. You know, and th there's other areas I'm guessing, Ken, that you would have exposures on. So, uh, so we will have to we have to let Ken 
who's been focused on this and all the coronavirus stuff. We have to let him get through that and then go do a good piece of work for us on what what does he think, and we have a little time to work on that, I think. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. So we will move on um, to the update on the new school building project. Well, could I just make a brief motion on on the budget? Um, because I want to make sure that um, you have the, you know, Rosa, you're going to be in a position where you'll be our spokesman, right? Mm -hmm. And I think you ought to take a vote to allow you to share this information, even though it's preliminary. Um, okay. And, and public, at any public. We took that motion last year uh, for Colette, and it gave her strength when she um, was uh, was communicating. And so I'd like to make a motion, if it's okay with all of you, uh, that all of the information that we shared tonight, including the broad directional statements and what Ken has, uh, Ken and John have provided, um, that we authorize our chairman to share that with the public. Second. There okay, Debbie seconded. Uh, any other discussion on that motion? Okay, so if you could all visually, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, and now um, the new school building project updates. So, John, can I hand this over to you if you have any? Sure. Any sure. To share? There. Um just very brief, uh, the uh, folks from Tecton were, were here uh, late last week and working with uh, Ken and with Whitson's on kind of the kitchen and cafeteria uh, design, you know how we go through our user groups. So that was great to have Whitson's as a part of that and, and the team, the local team, Alfonso was a big part of it. So um, that has happened. And uh, just recently I had a conversation with uh, Josh Flowers from the NBC and uh, Josh uh, shared that he has seen some of the um, uh, uh, updates to the, the, the design development that's going on with Tecton. I have not actually seen those just yet. I've been a little busy this week. And um, he uh, said it's really looking good. Um, so, so there's some progress. It's, uh, we continue to, to progress along. The good thing uh, that you need to know out of this week with all of the news that we've been dealing with is that Tecton has actually not been slowed down. They're continuing their design work. And so um, we remain um, on our timeline. So that's what I have. Thank you. You're welcome. John, is there, like, what's the next big deliverable from them or the next meeting that would be taking place? There is a meeting uh, right now scheduled for Friday morning, which is our executive team meeting. So we also have Mr. Dunn as part of that, Mr. Dombowski. Um, both uh, Josh and Paul from the NBC. Um, so I'll find out then what the next deliverable is, to be very honest. Um, in the last week, I've just lost track of exactly where they're at, so I can't accurately answer that, Deb. Okay. Is that meeting still going to happen after person? Mr. Mr. Dunn and I just talked before the board meeting, and a final decision has not been made on that yet. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so we can um, talk about three main points. Um, before we do that, could I add, add, uh, ask that we add an agenda item to our uh, to our agenda on uh, our board uh, bylaws? Would you be okay with that? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I think you'd need to take a motion to amend our agenda to add that. Okay. Uh, I move to amend our agenda to include a discussion or possible motion of suspending our bylaws. I'll second. Okay, Amy seconded. Bob, do you, um, so. Okay, take, a, take, a, take a vote on amending the motion and then I'll, uh, then I'll talk about what it is. All right, so all in favor of amending the agenda? Aye. 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 Okay. All 
All right, so the motion carries. Oh. Go ahead, Bob. All right, so look, guys, we have uh, bylaws that are part of our policies that require us that, that there's a policy number 9321, which is the time, place, and notification of meetings, which basically says our, our meetings are held at the high school and televised at the high, from the high school. And, uh, and there's, uh, uh, there's, uh, there's also 9325.43, which is about electronic participation. We are in a very unique situation. The governor is uh, guiding us all to have um, uh, to have these electronic meetings instead of meeting in person, which I think is absolutely correct. But I do think as a matter of course, we should agree as a board to suspend those two policies relative to the fact that we're having this as an electronic meeting. It's just good form. And so I would like to move that we suspend uh, temporarily policy for, for the purpose of having this electronic meeting uh, policies number uh, 9321 and 9325.43. Okay. Second. Joy. It's me being a purist, guys. <laughs> Joy has second. <laughs> Are there any questions on that? Okay. So all in favor of suspending those bylaws? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. All right. Now we can move on to our three main points. So I was going to send the, the COVID-19 update Yep. and the budget discussion and the new school update. Yeah, uh, I think that's pretty much all we talked about. Yep. I just wanted to say, to say one thing um, I meant to say earlier. I just, I know we all want to thank John and his whole team for leading us through this such a I mean, it, undescribable, unsure time. The uh, superintendent where I work described it as fighting a fire every day for a week. And I'm sure that's the way John has felt, And but he just remained so steady. So John, I really wanna thank you uh, for making us feel good, but also our parents and our kids really feeling um, comfortable and helping us through it. So thank you very, very much. Uh, you're Second. welcome, Jen. Thank, thank you. you. And thank yes, you very thank much. You. Uh, you're very welcome. And I have to thank the team. They have been incredible. And uh, while I may appear steady, uh, the team the team has had to be patient and endure a little bit of me as well. So um, I, I have to thank them. Uh, they've been absolutely amazing. And I'm, I'm inspired by them every day and, and inspired by this community. So thank you. Um, I agree. Yeah. I, since we're since we're doing this for a minute, I, I want to throw in something. Um, we handed out the technology department um, along with some extra support. June Gordon um, and uh, Carol Ann Darkangelo included. Um, the team came together today, and in less than 24 hours, we went from um, people requesting Chromebooks to handing out Chromebooks in about an hour and 15 minutes today. Um, and what? Um, I really want to say to, um, along with the two I just mentioned, I've also got Kathy Calavito, Susan Schmidt, Barbara McCarthy, and Stephen Clark, um, who both, when asked to come to work to do this, um, didn't say anything other than, when do you need us and where? Um, and we were running out with gloves and masks and clipboards and, and all that stuff. And uh, we made a lot of changes on the fly, but um, boy, we had a, a team really come together today. and. Uh, and, and get students devices that they're probably going to need for a while. So I, uh, since we're doing this, I wanted to throw that out there too. And, and Eric, I saw lots of really positive feedback where people were just posting about how responsive you and your team were and how easy it was. And I think that was a real comfort to people in a time that, again, feels so unsure and unsteady. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Thank you. John, I also just wanted to offer up if you need any help um, giving out the lunches every day? You know, I'd certainly be happy to go and help pass out lunches. Um, if there's any other need, whether it's with Chromebooks or anything else, please just let us know. I will say yes, Debbie. Alfonso could use the help tomorrow because I might not be able <laughs> to help him. So yes, thank you. Okay. 11 to 11.30. I will. 
John, I've had neighbors ask me if there's things that you, where you need help, like even driving lunches to students. Okay. Um, so, so if you have needs, let us all know. Very and we'll good. We'll see what yep. we can do about friends, neighbors, ourselves, whatever it takes. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. That's great. Great to know. And special thanks, Eric, for creating this environment for us to have this yeah. meeting tonight. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, this worked really well, I think. You're welcome. And, and, and during this meeting, I found some uh, some other ways that we can accommodate and be very flexible in this time that we have um, a, a state law that says we can do this and uh, two um, postponed policies that also say we can do this. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So, do we have any upcoming events? <laughs> I do not know. No. <laughs> no. Oh, no. <laughs> um, I'm looking here now. We do not have anybody um, that has submitted anything for public comment. So, um, I believe that's the last agenda item other than our anticipated executive session. Okay. Okay, I will move that the board enter into executive session for the purpose of discussing strategy and negotiations as it relates to collective bargaining. Second. Bob, you seconded the motion. Thank you. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So this concludes our publicly broadcasted portion of tonight's meeting. And thank you everybody for tuning in and staying with us and for making this seemingly pretty easy at least on our end. <laughs> thank you guys for sticking around this late at CSO. Okay, so um